Are you ready to make the most of your oil and gas mineral rights? Welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. Get the knowledge and resources you need to manage your minerals and royalties. Here is your host, Matt Sands. Hello and welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Sands, and I'm here to help you make the most of your mineral rights and royalties. And joining me, as always, is my co-host, Justin Williams. Justin, how's it going today? Hot summer doldrums right now in Colorado, but it falls around the corner. Things are getting cooler. So it's definitely starting to cool off a little bit at night. Yeah. Thank goodness we're having that reprieve at night, but yeah, still some pretty hot uh, days here, but lots of rain to break it up. So we'll take it. Absolutely. Yeah. It's been very wet this year in Colorado, despite what you might read in the news and hear about. It actually has been below average temperatures. Just anecdotally, I'll have to say we've had fewer 100 degree days here. I know Texas has been sweltering. So if you're listening to this uh, in Texas, definitely our thoughts are with you. Hopefully you have a pool in your backyard and you can get out of the heat and uh, cool off. Talking about uh, environment, and we're going to talk about environmental uh, side of oil and gas, and not so much the air emissions and CO2 emissions and stuff like that, but we're going to talk more about the stuff that happens underground. And especially when a well is at the end of its productive life, what we're going to really dive into today is the plugging and abandoning of wells, you know, why this is done, when do oil companies decide that it's time, you know, who does the work and who fits the bill, what are the steps required. We'll talk about orphan wells a little bit because there's a category of wells that never get plugged and abandoned that are become an environmental liability. And then we'll talk about sort of who's responsible for all this because I know I've gotten questions in the past, Justin, from a few listeners that are wondering, do I have to uh, foot the bill if this well gets plugged and abandoned? And, you know, am I on the hook for the expense of that or my proportional share of that? You nailed it, Matt. And I think, you know, we've also seen more media coverage here lately about abandoned oil and gas wells. So I think it's, it's raising questions for people that maybe they haven't even considered prior. Yeah, it raises questions. And I guess we'll start off with the good news with this. And from a mineral owner perspective, you do not bear the liability for you know either the cost or the environmental impact of these wells. So as a, as a mineral and royalty owner, we have the benefit of enjoying the royalties and the, you know, the production and the revenue from that production but we don't have the expense that falls on the working interest owner. In other words, the owner of the oil and gas lease. And so we're on the other side of that oil and gas lease as the lessor, as a mineral and royalty owner. So we don't have the expense associated with drilling and completing that well or operating it or the ultimate expense of plugging and abandoning that well when it stops producing or when it stops producing in paying quantities, or in other words, when it's not economic to continue to operate that well. And, you know, this has evolved over the years and for good reason. Um, There's environmental impact that can happen that we're going to talk about. There's um, the financial implications. And when you have a company that goes uh, bankrupt, what then? And there's just, that's developed over time from the problems that we've seen occur. And, you know, Matt, what are the main reasons that that oil and gas company why would they be seeking to do that? From their perspective, it's mostly economic reasons. And then why would they seek to do that? Why wouldn't they seek to do that? I think that's the harder question sometimes. Yeah, maybe we'll start with the hard one and why they might not look to proactively plug and abandon a well. And the reason for that might be that that well that is at the end of its economic life could be uh, holding a lease or holding multiple leases. And so if they were to plug and abandon that well, then those leases would expire. And if they had plans to drill additional wells in that area, they'd have to go back to the mineral owners and get a new oil and gas lease. And oftentimes today at a much less favorable terms from a oil and gas company perspective, because a lot of these historic leases that were signed in the 50s, 60s, 70s, even 80s have a one-eighth royalty. And maybe the going rate in that area is now a 20% or 25% royalty. So it has a material impact on the economics of those new wells, not to mention the upfront payment of additional lease bonus, which if you're talking about multiple sections of land, you're, you're probably getting into the millions of dollars that they'll have to invest to secure those leases. And, and then on top of that, they're going to have a smaller share of the revenue if they have 
a higher lease royalty rate. So in other words, as you can imagine, if you had the leases in that whole area were 12 and a half percent, the remaining part of that, that the lessee or the oil and gas company and the working interest partners would have is an 87 and a half percent interest in the revenues from the sale of oil and gas. If they have to go back and lease all those at 25% royalty, all of a sudden now they only get 75% of the revenue and the costs are still the same no matter what, right? So they're still going to drill the same depth, the same length, and you know, more than likely. And so the economics are adversely impacted by that. So that's a good reason for them to try to nurse along some of these low producing wells, also sometimes called stripper wells. And so they may try to just keep these going as long as possible and not proactively plug and abandon them. So that's where the mineral owner can come in. So if you're in this situation and you want to renegotiate your lease and you feel that the current well that is holding your lease is not producing in uh, paying quantities, you can request the operator release that lease and plug and abandon the well. Now, there may be some pushback and it may have to be escalated to the State Oil and Gas Commission or the Texas Railroad Commission if you're in Texas. And so that's something to think about. And usually they're not going to do it proactively if this is the case where they're planning on drilling additional wells in the future. Maybe they just aren't quite there yet from a capital budget standpoint. It's not going to happen in the immediate future, but they do have plans. And so that is something to think about. You know, there is an option potentially for you to request that that lease get get released. In other words, get, you know, get extinguished so that you can get a new uh, oil and gas lease with hopefully some more favorable terms. So Matt, on the flip side for oil and gas operators, there becomes a point where it's really just too expensive to continue operating that well. Um, not to mention nowadays, you've got the pressure from you know regulatory bodies for them to go ahead and make plans at least to plug that well. So what are some of the reasons that the operator would take the steps to plug and abandon that well? I'm sure it has to do with um, decreasing production. Yeah, you're spot on there. The uh, reasons to plug and abandon the well is that it's just not producing enough oil and gas to offset the operating costs. In other words, they're losing money each month to continue operating that well. And if they don't have plans to go in and drill additional wells in that area, then it makes sense for them to just sort of cut their losses, plug and abandon the well, have that one-time expense to plug and abandon and then reclaim the area, the surface, and, and then move on to the next area so they just don't keep losing money. Because over time, if they let it go for long enough, then you know, assuming they're continuing to operate the well and they don't shut it in, you know, or temporarily abandon it, then they're just going to keep losing money. The other thing that they might do is that situation that I just mentioned where they shut in the well. It's not making sense to continue operating it, checking on it and things like that. So they can do that for a certain amount of time within oil and gas regulations typically. And so then there become a cutoff point that they'll have to make the decision and end up plugging and abandoning it anyway. So this is a situation where they can only draw it out, I think, for so long. And like you mentioned, Justin, there's certainly some pressure from regulators to plug those low producing wells to stay in compliance and so forth. And you know, from an economic standpoint, the last thing I'll mention is that there are bonding requirements that are in place now, especially there are higher requirements where the company has to pay to the oil and gas commission when they permit the well or permit a new well, you know, the cost of effectively to plug and abandon that well so that if they happen to go out of business in the future, the state could come in and would have the funds to properly plug and abandon the well and not leave what's called an orphan well, which is basically a well that stops producing and doesn't get properly plugged and abandoned. It becomes a potential environmental liability becomes an eyesore, becomes an issue for the surface owner. They have to deal with this old well that's still on their property and potentially, you know, tanks and other equipment like that. So these are things that are now trying to be proactively addressed by states in terms of increasing the bonding amounts and increasing the requirements so that if a company does go bankrupt, that the state doesn't have to foot the bill. All right, Matt. And so talking about what we actually mean when we say plugging and abandoning the well, I think it's pretty uh, well known that really what, what we're worried about is making sure that that well bore is sealed and not going to impact the environment, so on and so forth. But what are the steps involved in actually plugging that well? It's not just 
getting that wellbore handled, but there's other steps. Like you mentioned, there's equipment on site, there's making sure that it's not going to leak and leach and all those fun things. Yeah. The thing that they'll do first of all is remove the surface equipment. They'll typically go to recycle that. A lot of it's you know, scrap metal. Now it does have environmental issues with it because it's had oil probably going through it for years and years. And so you'll have what's called norm or naturally occurring radioactive material. So basically that uh, will seep into the metal and they'll have to deal with that as you know potentially hazardous waste. So there's recyclers that will take that and they'll they'll deal with it and 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 usually that's something that they can get rid of fairly easy. Now in terms of the wellbore itself, what they'll do is they'll bring in a rig to plug and abandon the well. It's usually a smaller rig, although it depends on the depth and length of the well. And what they'll do is, you know, remove any downhole equipment, any tubing that's down there. And so they have the casing, which is basically the pipe that is cemented into the ground and the different layers of rock. And they will go down there and figure out, you know, where the productive layers were and make sure that they pump cement down into that layer that had perforations and that was producing and seal that off. And so what they'll do is just pump the cement down hole until they get a return. And then they'll basically pull up the tubing that they used to pump the cement down and then it'll that column of cement will set up and provide a plug in the producing layers. And then also to make sure nothing comes to the surface, first of all, but then also that none of the layers below the ground communicate with each other, or in other words, that no fluids from, let's say, an oil and gas bearing zone can go into an aquifer or a drinking water zone. And so there'll be specific requirements. They'll have to submit a plan to the state on how they plan on plugging the well. And then really, it's just a matter of bringing in the equipment to cement the well. There might be plugs that are inserted into the well that allow them to place cement at specific depths and or that allow them in the future to come in and drill through those plugs and recomplete the well and so they can put it back into production. Now, it just depends on, you know, again, what their thoughts are, I think, on the area, you know, the pressures involved, and there's a lot of technical side of things on how they decide to plug it. But then also, what are their future plans? And is there a possibility that they could come back in the future and use that well bore for recompleting the well into a different formation or something like that? So generally speaking, it's a pretty straightforward process. The technology that's being used today hasn't really changed very much, you know, from 50 or 100 years ago. It's pretty much just pumping cement down it. Now, in the, ba- in the past, when you have wells that were drilled before some of the state oil and gas commissions came to being, then they may have used techniques that aren't as solid, uh, no pun intended, but basically you can get issues where these wells that were improperly abandoned in the past before regulations went into a place that required them to do these things that I just mentioned. And and there's cases where a company might have to go in and um, re-abandon a well if it's not plugged properly. So, you know, pretty straightforward in terms of the steps involved. The whole idea and the whole goal at the end of the day is to prevent fluid migration between the rock layers and then also fluid migration from the well itself to the surface. And by plugging it with cement, then that takes care of both of those. And I don't think anybody will be surprised, Matt, that that plugging and abandoning process is not cheap. It's not, it's a, as you said, a highly technical process that takes um, specialized equipment. And from the operator side, you know, how do they go about creating those financial provisions? I'm sure being surprised by that at the end is not how the larger companies choose to handle that anymore. I'm sure it's factored into the project from, from the beginning. You're absolutely right. When they run economics on drilling a new well, at the end of the life, they'll have budgeted for basically closing that well or plugging that well once it stops producing in economic quantities. And so that'll be part of the overall economics. So from that standpoint, that's factored in. Now, the tricky part becomes, you know, when this occurs. So from the standpoint of a cash flow perspective, you know, I'm sure they're keeping some money on the books for that liability to plug those wells that are at the end of the life. And they're probably looking at that in a budgeting standpoint and putting that money aside. So that is something that also needs to be done, you know, in terms of operating 
on a day-to-day basis because this is a, an expense. And so this is something they'll have to, to pay for. And it will be something that they have to have the money set aside to do it. Now, it's not a problem for these really large oil and gas companies that have billions of dollars in cash, you know, set aside for investing in new projects as well as, you know, these types of plugging and abandoning expenses. But the, the issue sometimes can be for the smaller operators, you know, do they have the financial wherewithal if they're requested by the government to close several wells all at once, you know, hey, you have until the end of the year to plug these wells, then they might need to go back and negotiate with the state to say, well, you know, we can't afford to do that all at once. Can we split, uh, spread that out over a period of time? And so that's where potentially that discussion would happen. So that, you know, like you said, the, the financial provisions, you know, they need to have that money set aside to do this. It becomes more of an issue with smaller companies. And then also that's why the bond, the bonding requirements um, are in place. And a lot of states are increasing those bonding requirements. We have now the cost to plug and abandon those wells has increased as the cost of everything has increased with inflation and all of that. And so, you know, what they may have set aside originally is maybe not adequate in today's dollars to actually plug and abandon a well properly. So they're going and updating the regulations. You know, Colorado went through that whole process and set aside some new financial assurance regulations in 2022. And they have some very specific criteria of the types of wells that fall into the category for needing to be plugged and abandoned. And then it's put on the list and they're giving operators now, you know, a number of years to plan ahead to plug and abandon those identified wells. So there's rules and regulations that are being developed to make sure that we don't get into the position of having more and more orphan wells, or in other words, wells that the company has gone out of business, they still haven't been plugged and abandoned, and the liability falls on the state. Absolutely, ma'am. And you, you, like you just said, you know, this is a, a case of something that needed to happen because there were uh, operators that were bankrupt, or maybe these wells go far enough back that that operator is, is long out of business, and those are falling to those government agencies. Um, and it's not an inexpensive process, so that's kind of leaving them holding the bill if we don't have this regulation in place. And Matt, we talked about this a little bit at the beginning as to why they wouldn't want to plug and abandon a well because it might terminate those leases. Um, how exactly is those oil and gas leases are affected? And I know I, in my experience in West Texas, the, in New Mexico, um, this seems to be a very common thing. You know, you have these what, what's called stripper wells, and they tend to hold that lease. And like you said, there's a ton of land rolled up into that lease, and those operators don't want to lose that interest and have to go through that releasing process. Yeah. And like we were talking about before we hit record, I know you were mentioning a good point around, you know, when, when does a company proactively do this versus reactively do it? And I'd say in that situation you just outlined, they're not going to necessarily proactively plug and abandon the well and release the lease. And so they will wait until forced to do so. And so that's it, where if you're in that situation, you have a well that's a stripper well that is losing money and, you know, you could justify that based on, you know, industry criteria or state criteria, then you could go to the operator and request that they plug and abandon the well. You know, how responsive they're going to be to that may, may depend and you may need to get an attorney involved. And, you know, obviously that's a situation you should have a discussion with your attorney if you feel like you know, the wells that are holding your lease are, you know, sh- no longer economic to continue producing. They should be plugged and abandoned in the hopes of you getting a new lease with hopefully more favorable terms. There's pros and cons to that, I guess. If you're receiving royalties on a well, even if it is a stripper well, and you're not paying the expense for that well, but you are getting the the royalties. And if it's still a decent amount of money, then you have to realize you're going to be giving that up if you force them to plug and abandon the well. You have to have the foresight or have to have the knowledge or, you know, the insight into the potential of future development in that area, because there's a chance that you force the operator's hand, they plug the well, and then nothing else ever happens. And so you've actually foregone the additional royalties you could have received. You know, you're not able to then go and release those minerals at a, at more favorable terms. And so you've sort of shot yourself in the foot. So you have to have an idea that there is potential in maybe a deeper formation. Maybe this well is an old conventional vertical well that's producing from a formation that's uh, more shallow. And then 
operators are starting to drill uh, deep horizontal wells in your area. And so there's the potential that you'll have a deep horizontal well get drilled. And in, and in advance of that, you want to um, get a new lease in place. And in, in that case, it can make uh, sense, but I would be very careful and make sure you get help from probably a geologist or a petroleum engineer to make sure that there's that potential there and that that's a likely outcome. And then also from your attorney to start that process because they'll know state statutes and what your rights are under the law. And then you can go through, you know, start the ball rolling to go and and try to do that. And if you can, you know, again, build your case to say that that well is not producing and and paying quantities anymore. And man, I... I know this may not have been as common in the past, but a lot of leases now include clauses that talk about well abandonment and kind of set criteria involved in what that truly means. And I'm sure that helps landowners in the case that they do want to go through this process. But as you said, there's a lot of territory to navigate whether that is really the best option for you. And that's something that you really want to talk to an attorney about before you start kicking the tire. Yeah. And and that's important. I guess, you know, I didn't really mention that before, but, you know, make sure you look at your oil and gas lease and see what your rights are under the lease. Cause that'll really ultimately dictate, you know, if if the language in there specifies that a well has to meet certain criteria in order to continue to hold that lease. If you have a larger mineral tract to where you've negotiated a lease of that has some more favorable language in terms of, you know, allowing you to request this type of stuff or there's very clear criteria for when well should be plugged and abandoned. And that's, I think, where that can come in as well in terms of making sure that it's clearly documented when a well meets that criteria. And then it's not a legal battle to try to get the wells plugged and to release your lease. Because that is the other outcome is the uh, operator might decide that it's cheaper to fight you and to litigate it rather than to just give up and release it. So it is something to be uh, mindful of. Um, I guess worst case, if that happens, you can just give up and not have to go through that process. If you feel like it's a losing battle, you know, you're not going to benefit more than it would cost you to, even if you won sort of a thing. So it's, it's something to keep in mind and your attorney should be able to advise you if you're in that boat. Again, this is a, maybe that's a very specific and unique situation, but it is something to be mindful of as to, you know, when, when a well should be plugged and, you know, you got to, you know, fight for your rights if you're in that situation where you feel like it, that should happen. All right, Matt. And environmental, when it comes to environmental and plugging wells, you know, I, I, this is what you see on the news. These are the things that we see. And we, most recently there was the West Texas geyser that was a saltwater disposal well was shooting up in the air because it was um, an unknown well in an unknown formation in a saltwater disposal adjacent area. And it's a really bad look for oil and gas operators and for the industry as a whole. So this is something that, you know, I think nowadays the industry is very sensitive to taking care of this, but it's important in not properly plugging those wells has an environmental impact that comes with it. And then we see these crazy things that happen and puts a bad look on the entire industry. Yeah, that's a great point. I think that was a prime example of what operators don't want to happen. And in that situation, you know, Chevron was the operator, I think of a well that was like 20 feet away. And they ended up finding this well that nobody knew about. They didn't know what depth it went to, didn't know who originally owned it. It was before any of the records existed within the Texas Railroad Commission. And so that that Texas Railroad Commission, I think was formed in the twenties. And so any wells that were drilled in the late 1800s or, you know, early 1900s, there were spotty records. And so in that situation, that well, in this case, obviously didn't get properly plugged and abandoned. Like Justin mentioned, you have saltwater disposal going on. In other words, produced water that is injected down hole into these formations that are no longer producing oil and gas or you know deep formation. And if a well is improperly cased or improperly abandoned, then those deeper formations that have high pressure can communicate with either shallower formations or the surface in this case. And in that very graphic example with salt water getting spewed a hundred feet into the air, you know, it looked like uh, it had snowed there. Of course it was, hadn't snowed. It was just the salt, you know, as the water evaporated. So that is a situation that again, like Justin said, puts a black eye in the industry. They want to avoid that at all costs. And in the case of uh, that particular well, Chevron stepped in and took care of that. And uh, even though technically I think they 
weren't originally responsible for it, but you know, by maybe getting the leasehold interest down the road and drilling additional well or having a well that they had financial responsibility for, they sort of inherited it and, you know, it was the right thing to do. So they went and fixed it. But it's one of those things. There's a lot of these wells that are not properly uh, documented because, you know, they were drilled before the records uh, started to be kept at the state level, before those regulations went into a place around how to properly plug and abandon the wells. And so those orphan wells are the wells that haven't been properly plugged and abandoned. There is potential environmental issues with that, both from groundwater contamination or aquifer contamination and methane leakage, which is always, you know, it's kind of in the press lately around global warming and stuff like that. So it's it's something the industry needs to address and, and they are addressing it. There are, again, more strict regulations being passed in states to address this. And companies are proactively going and, you know, if they have acreage where they're going to go drill new wells, oftentimes they will either proactively plug those old wells to make sure that they don't get into an issue. Because another time when you can have a potential issue is when you complete a new well, you have high pressure water downhole. And if that orphan well or, or improperly abandoned well goes through that same formation, then you could have high pressure coming up to the surface and that could be an issue for another reason. So that's something where Oftentimes, either as part of the permit to drill the new well, the, the state will require them to plug any wells that are in the potential area that could be affected by that new well, or they might do that proactively themselves to get it, to avoid that situation that we saw in West Texas in the beginning of 2022 with that man-made geyser that basically was created. So, you know, an imp- important issue for sure, and it is the right thing to do. And then certainly if you're a surface owner, this becomes a situation where if there's an orphan well, you need to potentially request to the state that it get plugged and then it could get put on a list for them to come in and, and deal with. Or there are organizations like the Well Done Foundation, which is a charitable foundation that actually is plugging and abandoning orphan wells across the country. And so there's different organizations that are starting to get involved to take care of this issue. Absolutely, man. We talked a little bit earlier about, you know, companies going bankrupt and then leaving wells unplugged. But, you know, this is an issue that still occurs today, but also is an issue of the past. And that well in West Texas may have very well been a case like that. And then what you don't know about, you don't know about. And as you mentioned, that Well Done Foundation, they're really helping to go find those wells, those orphan wells that were forgotten, or maybe the company went bankrupt, and trying to fix that. Uh, But really, from a regulatory standpoint, they're really trying to put reforms into place, whether it is the bonds uh, and assurances. And that's something that many states have really looked at this in the past few years. Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, in Colorado and In Colorado in particular, we talked about this in episode 150, so you can go back and listen to that. And uh, we dive into the new COGCC regulations around the financial assurance. And there's two sides to that. You know, there's one side that from a royalty owner perspective, you want your wells to produce as long as possible. And if a well is continuing to produce as a low producing well, which I think in Colorado, they categorize as a well that produces a daily average less than two barrels of oil equivalent or 10,000 cubic feet of natural gas per day. So that's a daily average you know, over the past 12 months. And so that's a situation where, you know, if you have a decent royalty on a well that's only, you know, it is producing two barrels of oil per day, that's 60 barrels a month, you know, you're, you're still getting royalties on that. So on one hand, from a royalty owner perspective, you want that well to continue to operate as long as possible. Uh, On the other hand, from, you know, the environmental side of things, you want that to get plugged and abandoned properly prior to becoming an issue from that standpoint. So it's a, it's a definite balance. And I think maybe being overly prescriptive, overly prescriptive, like Colorado could be argued that that is maybe a well that could still continue to produce for a while if the operating costs are especially low. And so I think it should be criteria that should be manageable. The industry should have input into this. And so, you know, as each of these states are updating their regulations to to address these issues and preventing orphan wells, you know, they should have a, a definite seat at the table in addressing the criteria to make sure it makes sense and it's not going to be plugging these wells before they technically should have been. 
Absolutely, ma'am. And you know, we've taken a deep dive, and really, there's there's just a few main points. And and when you look at it at a high level, there's the economic reasons that those oil and gas companies want to plug and abandon those wells. And then on the flip side, there's the environmental importance and and the regulatory importance on that side. That there's a plan in place for that to be taken care of in the off chances and scenarios. And this is something where the regulatory bodies and the oil and gas operators, whether forcibly or on their own accord, have been working together to really try and improve this over the last years. Yeah, you've uh, summarized it well, I think. And, the, and then ultimately, the end goal is to prevent the issue of orphan wells going forward. We know that that's an issue now in the industry. There are thousands of orphan wells across the country that are being addressed slowly but surely. And, you know, once we get on top of that, we want that issue to, you know, get resolved and not to continue in the future as maybe smaller operators go bankrupt that, you know, they've put up a bond that's big enough to adequately pay for the proper closure of the well and the uh, reclamation of the surface. And so that's another aspect of this that happens that we really didn't talk about a whole lot, but especially if you have the surface rights and the mineral rights, the ultimate goal is that you should be able to use that land like you were able to before that well was drilled. And so what you would want to see is the well getting capped well below the surface, especially if you have a field that you're going to plow, that the plow doesn't hit the the wellhead or hit the cap from that well. So you want that deep enough that it's not going to cause a problem that you could use that as a, you know, productive agriculture land or grazing land and that kind of a thing. And so that's something to keep in mind. And that is a discussion with the operator. And if you have a surface use agreement, you know, going forward, that would dictate the terms of any wells that are drilled in the future. But if you've inherited this, maybe a well existed when you bought the land, there wasn't a surface use agreement. There's not a clear description of how that land should be left. That becomes a potential discussion as well. Uh, with the operator around how you want that land to be left so that it doesn't become an additional expense for you to restore it like you want it to get restored. So you'd want to have the operator do that for you, ideally, depending on the situation. Obviously, it's a, if it's an orphan well, then you know you may be stuck with having to pay for some of that yourself. But ideally, you have the operator take care of it. You said it, Matt, and I'm sure this will continue to evolve and change over the years, too, as uh, technology gets better. And, and as you mentioned, the process has been the same, so maybe we're due for some advancement. Yeah, I think the advancements now are looking at how can we do it more cost-effective? How can we be more efficient? And so uh, that's certainly something that's being looked at as well. And uh, if you're in this situation, you have a well that is potentially shut in for an extended period of time, you want to know what your rights are. We have a couple of episodes that address that. We have episode 53, where we talked about what to do when your well gets shut in. And that was with uh, attorney Spencer Cox. And then we talked about, again, episode 57, a little more detail about what to do when your wells get shut in, more into the side of things, not from negative royalties or you know from a, a financial standpoint, but more of the reasons why a well might get shut in, but maybe not permanently. Maybe it's for new wells getting completed. So you know, I have royalties on some wells right now that we, we stopped getting a royalty check in January. You know, it's it's August right now. And the reason they shut in those wells was because they were com- drilling and completing some new wells that were adjacent to it. And so they have to do that for a short time frame uh, temporarily just to make sure that that doesn't cause issues when they frack the new wells, that the existing wells don't get impacted adversely. So it is something that if a well gets shut in, it's not the end of the world. It could be that they're going to come in and drill new wells, and that's a great thing. But then, you know, again, if it's longer term shut in, it's been going on for a while, you need to make sure that you look at your oil and gas lease and stand up for your rights and make sure that you get that plugged and abandoned if you want to renegotiate, like we talked about, or, you know, again, that you just find out what's going on and, and figure out what the best course of action is for your particular situation. As always, find the links to these episodes we mentioned in the show notes, which can be found at mineralrightspodcast.com. So thanks again for listening. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Matt. Thanks so much for listening to the Mineral Rights Podcast with your host, Matt Sands. Don't forget to subscribe and share at mineralrightspodcast.com. The Mineral Rights Podcast should not be construed as investment, legal, or tax advice. All information is believed to be from reliable sources. However, we make no representation as to its completeness or accuracy.